well, welcome back to the next session. This one is on the impacts of climate change, and we have three established scientists here who are going to speak with us. I'll make my introduction as quick as possible so that gives them the maximum time. Uh, first person up speaking is Dr. Craig Itso. He's the founder and former president of the Center for the Study of Carbon Dioxide and Global Change. He currently serves as chairman of the Center's Board of Directors. Since 1998, he's been the editor and chief contributor to the online magazine CO2 Science, which you should check out at co2science.org, which in fact I used in my course at Carleton quite a lot. Um, Dr. Itso has been involved in the global warming debate for many years. He's a Bachelor of Science in Geography, Master's in Agronomy, and a PhD in Geography. And he's published in peer-reviewed scientific articles on issues related to coral reefs, which you'll hear about today, uh, seasonal cycle of CO2, urban CO2, and other things. He's an author of several books, the most recent of which, The Many Benefits of Atmospheric CO2 Enrichment, details 55 ways in which the rise in atmospheric CO2 is benefiting the Earth's environment, the Earth's biosphere. He's also produced three videos, one of which, which is called The Carbon Dioxide and Climate Crisis, Reality or Illusion, I showed to the 1,500 students who took my courses at Carleton over the last few years, and they greatly enjoyed it. Uh, Dr. Itso, and this is perhaps his greatest claim to fame in the last few years, certainly his busiest activity, is uh, co-editor of the massive and very important non-governmental international panel on climate change. Okay, and that, for we really thank you for that, because that's a phenomenal tool. So with that, I introduce Dr. Itso. Thank you, Tom. It's a pleasure for me to be here today with a, just a brief acknowledgement before I begin. I'd like to express my gratitude to my wife who's accompanied me on this trip. It is our 20th anniversary today and uh, hope to have many, many more with such a wonderful spouse. All right, to begin, according to climate alarmist theory, as the air's CO2 content rises in response to ever-increasing anthropogenic CO2 emissions and as more and more carbon dioxide dissolves into the surface waters of the world's oceans, the pH of the planet's oceanic waters should be decreasing. Based on this theory, it has been estimated that the globe's seawater has already declined by about 0.1 pH unit relative to what it was in pre-industrial times. And model calculations imply that there could be an additional drop somewhere in the neighborhood of between 0.3 and 0.7 pH unit by the year 2300. Now, a potential pH reduction of this magnitude is viewed by many as a cause for great concern, for it has been postulated to harm marine life not only by reducing calcifying rates of marine organisms, but also negatively impacting their rates of metabolism, growth, fertility, and survival. This ocean acidification hypothesis, as it has come to be known, has gained great momentum in recent years because it offers a second independent reason to regulate fossil fuel emissions in addition to that provided by concerns over traditional global warming. For even if the models are proven not to be correct with respect to their predictions of atmospheric warming, extreme weather, glacial melt, sea level rise, or any other attendant catastrophe, those who seek to regulate and reduce CO2 emissions have a fallback position, claiming that no matter what happens to the climate, the nations of the Earth must reduce their greenhouse gas emissions because of the direct impacts of marine, or because of the direct impacts of CO2 on marine organisms via ocean acidification. Now, over time, the rhetoric of these acidification alarmists has swelled tremendously, giving rise to claims that by mid-century, if we continue emitting carbon dioxide the way we have been, entire vast areas of the Southern Ocean and the Arctic Ocean will be so corrosive that it will cause seashells to dissolve, and that we're really in the last decade of coral reefs on this planet for at least the next million plus years, unless we do something very soon to reduce CO2 emissions. Similar sentiments have been expressed by others who are concerned about the potential consequences of ocean acidification, with one alarmist scientist going so far as to claim that we know that coral reefs are particularly sensitive to ocean acidification. And the reason for that is that corals are unable to form their skeletons as quickly as they used to. And reefs are starting to crumble and disappear. We may lose those ecosystems within 20 to 30 years. 
We've got the last decade in which we can do something about this problem. But it's very, very clear that if we don't start to deal with it right now with very, very stern cuts to emissions, we are going to condemn oceans to an extremely uncertain future. Well, the ocean chemistry aspect of the ocean acidification theory is rather straightforward, but it is not as solid as model projections, alarmist scientists, politicians, or, em or even famous movie stars make it out to be. For one thing, the work of a number of respected scientists suggests that the drop in oceanic pH will not be nearly as great as the IPCC and others predict. This figure shows much of the past and projected history of fossil fuel carbon utilization, together with the historical and projected atmospheric CO2 concentrations out to the year 2050, as calculated by the well-respected NOAA scientist Peter Tans. As can be seen here, his analysis indicates that the air's CO2 concentration peaks well before 2100 and at only 500 parts per million, as compared to an 800 part per million value predicted in one of the IPCC's major scenarios. Now, when these emissions estimates are transformed into reductions of oceanic pH, it can readily be seen that TANS's projection at 2100 is far below that predicted by the IPCC. TANS's analysis also projects a pH recovery to values near those of today by the year 2300, suggesting that the ensuing atmospheric CO2 increase and associated oceanic pH decrease will not be anywhere near as serious as the acidification alarmists make it out to be. There are also important other reasons for not jumping on the ocean acidification bandwagon, chief among which is the fact that as with all phenomena involving living organisms, the introduction of life into the equation greatly complicates things. For when a number of interrelated biological phenomena are considered, it becomes much more difficult, if not impossible, to draw up such sweeping negative conclusions about the reaction of marine organisms to ocean acidification as the alarmists often portray. Quite to the contrary, when life is considered, ocean acidification is more often than not found to be a non-problem. I illustrated this latter point a few years ago at a prior international climate change conference where I presented an analysis of 568 experimental results detailing the responses of various growth and developmental related parameters of marine organisms, including calcification, growth, metabolism, fertility, and survival immersed at seawater at or near today's oceanic pH level, as well as at lower values than those of today. Shortly thereafter, as an outgrowth of that presentation, I created an online ocean acidification database at the CO2 Science website where I posted each of the 568 experimental results and where new records have been added weekly ever since that time. Now, from those humble beginnings, the database now incorporates nearly 1,400 individual records and is the largest database of its kind in the world. For the remainder of my talk, therefore, I would like to share some of what, some of what has been learned from those additional records with respect to the potential impacts of ocean acidification on important growth and developmental related patterns or parameters as shown here. In this next slide, I have lumped all of the data points together into one graph, plotting the percent change in all measured parameters, calcification, fertility, growth, metabolism, and survival, as a function of the decline in pH from the present. The take-home message I wish to impart from this slide is that there is a wide range of pH values under which the 1,400 experimental results were obtained, which, which range represents a change in atmospheric CO2 in excess of 100,000 parts per million. Now it should be obvious to everyone here that the world's atmosphere will likely never reach a concentration of 100,000 parts per million, or 10,000 parts per million, or perhaps even 1,000 parts per million as suggested by Peter Tanz's analysis. So in this next graph, I have highlighted a range of values that I call far, far beyond the realm of reality. This range runs from a pH decline of 0.5 unit, which represents the high end 
of most IPCC projections for the year 2100 all the way to the uppermost pH decline explored in the various experiments. Thus, we could probably expect little argument even from those who think ocean acidification is going to be a problem in excluding from our analysis all those values beyond a pH de decline of 0 0.5. For there is simply no realistic scenario in which we will ever emit enough CO2 into the atmosphere to cause the ocean's pH decline or pH 2 decline to the values used in those experiments. To put it bluntly, experiments conducted at these pH values are not designed for scientific discovery or realism, but for agenda-driven shock value. Returning to the real world, therefore, in this figure I've plotted the results of all experiments that fall within a pH decline range of 0 to, point to 0 0.3, highlighting the values that fall within a pH decline range derived by TANS for the year 2100. And most interestingly, over this pH range, the linear trend is actually positive, suggesting that there will be an overall beneficial response of the various growth and developmental parameters as the atmosphere's CO2 concentration rises and the ocean's pH values decline, which observation, of course, stands in stark contrast to the gloom and doom predictions of the acidification alarmists. Analyzing the situation further, in the next set of slides, I've plotted the average of all responses for each of the five variables stratified in the database over five pH decline ranges. Three of those ranges should be familiar to you. The far, far beyond the realm of reality range, the warped world of the IPCC, and the range of the TAN study. Now, the other two ranges include those values between the TAN study and the IPCC ranges, and those lower than the TAN study. As we plot the mean responses and delta pH values of those five ranges, this is what we get. As you can see here, there is a, a fair amount of variability in the records, but let us not forget that the vast majority of the values represented in the line plots fall within that far, far beyond the realm of reality category, represent, representing a pH decline range that will never, ever occur. So to make more sense of what might happen as a result of a future rise in CO2 emissions, I have prepared a slide that presents a close-up of the pH decline range from zero to the upper end of the IPCC's projections at 0.5. Now over this range, metabolism and growth of marine life are enhanced as pH declines, survival remains about the same, and fertility and calcification appear to decline. Zooming in a little closer, I next present a view of, of the responses of those, for only those studies or values that will likely occur in the future, such as that over the TAN study. The most striking feature of this image is a lack of negative responses, suggesting that on the whole, again, marine organisms will not be harmed by the expected decline, but may actually benefit from it. Which latter presumption is further borne out by this scatter plot of all experimental data points for all categories as shown previously. And again, as I showed you this figure, the most striking uh, significance about this is its lack of a downward trend in the data. In fact, the linear trend is a positive 28%, although the R squared value is so small, the slope of the line is not significant statistically. But nevertheless, these and the prior results I've shown you are a far, far cry from those doomsday scenario predictions of the acidification alarmists who claim that we're in the last decades of coral reefs on this planet for at least the next million years plus, and so on and so forth. Well, in addition to what is depicted in the prior graphs, there are other important phenomena that give reason to believe that the predicted decline in oceanic pH will have no lasting negative effects on marine life. For starters, most experimental analyses only assess an organism's response to ocean acidification in isolation, ignoring the important and sometimes critical interplay it experiences with other life forms within its little part of the world. However, much research has shown that the responses of other entities and processes within a marine community have the potential to buffer the negative impacts of CO2-induced acidification on neighboring organisms. As one example of this phenomenon, seagrass photosynthetic rates have been shown to increase by as much as 50% in response to increased CO2 levels, which increase may deplete the community CO2 pool, thereby maintaining an elevated pH that may protect associated calcifying organisms from the impacts of broader ocean acidification. Now, another reason to be skeptical of 
of the acidification alarmist projections resides in the fact that the models upon which the ocean acidification threat is based are focused on changes in bulk water chemistry that do not represent conditions actually experienced by many marine organisms which are separated from the bulk water of the ocean by a diffusive boundary layer. Now this is important because photosynthetic activity such as that of the zooxanthellae that are hosted by corals actually deplete the CO2 and raise pH so that the pH that is actually experienced by the organisms on the inside of this diffusive boundary layer can differ greatly from that of the bulk water. Beyond these considerations, it is important to note that essentially all forms of marine life have the inherent genetic capability to adapt and evolve. Of the 1,400 experimental uh, results reported previously, for those studies that stated the length of time the organisms were subjected to reduced pH levels, the median value was only 20 days. And many of those experiments were conducted over periods of only a few hours, which is much too short of a time for organisms to adapt or evolve to successfully cope with those environmental conditions. However, studies exploring this aspect of the debate confirm that adaptation and evolution can and do take place, and on very short timescales, allowing marine organisms to not only withstand and cope with declining oceanic pH, but to benefit and take advantage of it. Well, my time is up, and we have only scratched the surface in our exploration of this issue. Nevertheless, I hope it is as clear to you as it is to me, based on numerous real-world observations and laboratory experiments, that recent theoretical claims of impending marine species extinctions due to increases in the atmosphere's CO2 concentration have no basis in empirical reality. In fact, these unsupportable contentions are actually refuted by demonstrable facts as highlighted in this presentation and explored in depth in many of the research papers that we've reviewed on our CO2 science website. Once again, therefore, it appears that life has found a way to overcome adversary, and another mega disaster in the making has been averted. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.